Hi, I'm Ash Bennington, Senior Editor and Crypto Editor at Real Vision. Earlier this week, Elon Musk announced a major change of policy at Tesla regarding Bitcoin. Specifically, no one will be able to purchase cars from Tesla using Bitcoin. This is a significant change of direction from a company that invested $1.5 billion in Bitcoin for its own corporate treasury function earlier this year. Here's what he said on Twitter. Tesla has suspended vehicle purchases using Bitcoin. We are concerned about rapidly increasing use of fossil fuels for Bitcoin mining and transactions, especially coal, which has the worst emissions of any fuel. Cryptocurrency is a good idea on many levels, and we believe it has a promising future, but this cannot come at great cost to the environment. Tesla will not be selling any Bitcoin, and we intend to use it for transactions as soon as mining transitions to more sustainable energy. We are also looking at other cryptocurrencies that use less than 1% of Bitcoin's energy slash transactions. Musk then went on to tweet a graph of annualized electricity consumption. In the wake of these statements, Bitcoin dropped 17% from over $62,000 to under $50,000 $50,000 per coin. At Real Vision, we're committed to telling every side of the story, so we wanted to bring you a conversation from our recent crypto gathering. It's a presentation delivered by Meltem Demirs entitled Bitcoin Will Green the Planet. It's followed by a panel discussion hosted by Meltem with Whit Gibbs, Caroline Cochran, and Mustafa Yahim. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, um, I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Melton Demirs, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at CoinShares. We are a global investment firm with $5 billion in assets under management, a large capital markets desk, um, and we are publicly listed on the NASDAQ Nordic under the ticker CS. That is us. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, though, something that's been a key area of research for my team at CoinShares over the last four years, which is Bitcoin mining, where the energy comes from, and where Bitcoin mining is going. So. As you may have noticed, in the crypto space, we like to make bold and unsubstantiated claims. So I'm going to start today by making a bold and unsubstantiated claim. Um, And then I'm going to share with you some data and some information um, that will help back up the claim I'm making. And then I'm going to bring in three panelists who are experts in their respective domains to talk about it some more. So here is my bold and unsubstantiated claim. It is that Bitcoin will green the planet. So hopefully you look at that. Hopefully you find it slightly incendiary or slightly perplexing. Um, And hopefully I'll be able to demystify some of my rationale around making this statement. So let's get right into it. Here's my disclaimer, my disclosure. Um, Feel free to read it. It's linked in my Twitter bio. My compliance team would like me to direct you to read it. (laughs) All right. Let's start with some facts. It is a fact that Bitcoin mining or the act of securing the Bitcoin network is highly energy intensive. Nobody is disputing this fact. Bitcoin is very transparent about its energy usage. The chart you're seeing here is Bitcoin's hash rate, which is the purple line, which is the amount of computational effort pointed at the Bitcoin network. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, It costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. It's 
energy usage. And the chart you're seeing here is Bitcoin's hash rate, which is the purple line, which is the amount of computational effort pointed at the Bitcoin network compared to Bitcoin's price, which is the blue line. Now, as many of you know, Bitcoin requires silicon in the form of ASICs or specialized chips and energy in order to provide its security guarantee. So Bitcoin's security measure as a financial network is effectively the hash rate. It's an important place to start. Now, the second point I want to make, which is also a fact as far as I know, is there is no electricity police. A lot of times people like to make a moral argument about Bitcoin's energy usage. But if we had an energy police, we wouldn't have all of this shit. <laughs> we have very, very frivolous uses of energy today. And the fact of the matter is the market, right, and people's willingness to pay for energy dictates what energy gets used for. All right, now let's talk about energy usage and its role in society. The evolution of technology and the evolution of our society demands increased energy. This is a fact. If we look at humanity's energy usage over the last 20 years and where it's going over the next 20 to 30 years, really what we should focus on is not our usage of energy, but the sources of energy that we're utilizing. Um, the Kardashev cycle, which is a, a energy cycle that's been described, um, really alludes to the fact that as humanity's technology evolves, we need better, more uh, energy dense, no emission sources of energy to fuel that growth. And if we want to become an intergalactic species, uh, which I certainly do, it will be very important to focus not on fossil fuels, but on hydro, nuclear, renewables, and other no-carbon sources of energy. Another fact, Bitcoin is a money battery. It allows us to transport energy across space and time in the form of money. It's immutable intergalactic information. That sounds like a lot, but let me explain. Prior to Bitcoin, the only thing we had that could transport value across space and time in a universal manner was gold. Gold is a shiny rock. Bitcoin is not a rock. Bitcoin is so much more than digital gold. And I really want to sort of highlight this digital gold narrative was a starting point, but Bitcoin is really much more. Bitcoin is more than money. Bitcoin is a form of compute infrastructure and energy infrastructure. And we'll delve into that more in our conversation today. Now, Bitcoin mining today is mainly fueled by renewable energy. This is, whether you like it or not, actually a fact. We did a research uh, report in 2019, a bottoms-up analysis of all Bitcoin miners around the world, and our research found that 77% of Bitcoin mining was done with renewables. Other institutions like uh, the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance have found similar numbers. Now, if we look at the Bitcoin mining footprint, what you see here is a map from our 2019 December mining report. What you see is the blue dots, which are major regions for Bitcoin mining, correspond with locations where there are ample renewables. Bitcoin enhances the energy grid. You can switch it on and off as needed. And Bitcoin is naturally incentivized to seek the lowest cost energy. And in many places around the world, naturally occurring sources of renewable energy are not located close to industrial centers. In fact, the Sichuan region of China alone produces more than enough power, excess power that goes unutilized to power the Bitcoin network, which is why that area of the world has been such a hotbed for Bitcoin mining. Here's another fact. China dominates Bitcoin mining because China has invested aggressively in renewable energy infrastructure. If we look at uh, China's renewable energy production over the last 20 years, 10 years, pardon, China has gone from having 9% renewables in its energy mix to now being close to 20%, with a target goal of being at 50% by the end of 2030. What's really interesting is last year alone, China put more renewable energy production capacity online than every other country in the world combined, and then some. So I think it's very important to understand that this isn't just a story about Bitcoin and a story about Bitcoin's energy consumption. This is a story about public policy and infrastructure investment and the mix of energy that is put into the grid. The energy grid is built to accommodate peak demand, but energy consumption is not linear. 
So if we look at the way the energy grid works, um, the energy grid needs to be dynamic. Our base load is typically met by uh, energy sources that are highly stable, but peak demand is what we've designed the energy grid for, which makes it really hard to add new sources of energy, new types of energy to the grid, which is particularly prevalent in the United States where people who are producing renewable energy often can't contribute it back to the grid. So how are we gonna utilize that energy that can't be contributed back to the grid? Well, Bitcoin is a potential way to monetize that energy that can't be otherwise monetized. And again, my guests will talk more about this. Lastly, and here's the summation of all of these points, Bitcoin mining will make the transition from fossil fuels to renewables economically feasible. Let me say that again. I believe Bitcoin mining will make the transition from fossil fuels to renewable and no carbon sources of energy economically feasible. Today, without major government subsidies, it is not economically feasible in Western Europe and the United States to invest in more renewable capacity. Bitcoin and private industry can make this possible. And it's not just about the power sector. This also touches on heating and cooling systems and energy storage. But for today's purposes, um, I really wanna delve into this conversation. I believe that Bitcoin's impact on the global energy has already been profound and will only become more profound in the coming decades. But that energy that is being contributed to Bitcoin's hash rate will primarily be sourced from renewables. And there are a number of people in the industry making sure that that is the path we take going forward. So some of you may have seen this chart before. It's one I like to use often. While Bitcoin may have started as a financial asset, Bitcoin is also a compute and connectivity network. Being on the Bitcoin network allows you to transmit and relay information. Typically, that's transactions and UTXOs. But it also allows you to transmit other types of information in a highly secure and immutable fashion. In addition, I think the Bitcoin industry will begin to intersect with the energy industry. And as we know, the energy industry industry is a vital part of our cybersecurity complex because we utilize energy to power all sorts of compute and connectivity, as well as our military industrial complex. Securing access to energy, to compute and connectivity, and to critical financial systems is a very important part of what political warfare will look like in the future. And so I think Bitcoin will create new markets for new types of macro sort of global competition between not only nation states, but all sorts of actors. And it's very important to think not only about the financial markets component, but also the compute market component and the energy market component. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome my panelists. I am really excited at just the great mix of expertise we have here today. So instead of doing introductions, which are quite boring, um, what I'd like to do is just start by inviting each panelist to just talk about a specific topic related to what I just shared. So we're gonna start um, with Mustafa. So Mustafa um, is with Bishan and they operate about 2.5% uh, of the hash rate today, 300 megawatts. And Mustafa, you've been sharing a lot of information from your perspective, working you know, with a company that does a lot of mining in China. I'd love for you to just share a little bit about you know, your experiences over the last few years, just watching this Bitcoin energy China narrative unfold. What are we missing here? What's the reality of the situation on the ground? Because um, you're actually operating mining operations. Yeah, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Mustafa. I'm the vice president of Bishin Group. Uh, we're one of the largest uh, wallet provider and miner in Asia market. Uh, we started mining in uh, 2009 and currently manage about, like Meltem said, about 300 megawatt. Uh, that translates to around 25 to 3% of the global Bitcoin uh, network. Um, so I, in China, uh, currently, how miners operate is that during the summer region, a uh, summertime, uh, basically through October till May, uh, we, we call that uh, winter and summer uh, season. During the summer season, we mostly operate in Sichuan region um, using hydro, 100% uh, close to renewable and hydropower. And then during the winter, we go to migrate and go to Inner Mongolia and Xinjiang, uh, where we operate using the grid system. I think um, a lot of people have a misconception that uh, China uses a lot of, uh, burn a lot of coal uh, during the winter time. 
uh, and that is completely not true. So the currently in China, like take Xinjiang as an example, where we have a very uh, major operation, 43% of the grid system is powered by uh, renewable energy. And that rate uh, since 2009 is increasing at a very fast speed. Uh, Xinjiang yeah. province alone currently uh, supports almost uh, or planning to support 20 other provinces in China. So it does have a lot of excessive um, energy. But at, at the same time, um, it, it is uh, planning to becoming more and more uh, renewable. Yeah, and I think that's one important fact to highlight is China has been moving very rapidly towards decarbonization from a variety of sources. I think that narrative often gets missed uh, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. But if we look at the facts, I think they tell a very different story. Um, I'll go to you next, Wit. Um, Wit is the CEO and founder of Compass Mining Disclosure. I am an investor and board member of Compass. Um, but Wit, you are building a marketplace for not only mining hardware in the form of ASICs, but also hosting facilities. Uh, I myself host a miner with you at a facility in Kentucky, but I'd yeah. love for you to talk a bit more about how you see the hosting side evolving because you're working with a lot of really large miners, enterprises, as well as individuals who want to contribute hash to the network. And I know you're very actively involved in talking to facilities about where their energy comes from. So what are you seeing in your day-to-day -day work at companies? This. So right now, I mean, most facilities are drawing from the grid, and the grid is a mix. You'll have, depending on the, the ISO where these facilities are located, and in the United States, there's a handful of different ISOs, uh, but they, they take a mix of energy, some from fossil fuels, growing numbers are from renewables, uh, and we see that as a trend that's going to continue. I mean, if you look at, let's say, Texas, right, the ERCOT market in Texas, in 2006, you had 46% of that coming from natural gas, 37% was coal, and only 2% was wind. Fast forward to 2020, now in ERCOT, you've got still 46% natural gas, but coal has been cut to 18%. Yeah. And you've got you've got the, the wind power now contributing about 23% of that market. And we're seeing this as a trend that's continuing throughout the other ISOs in the U.S. What we're looking at now are what are the what are the carbon emissions plans that most of these these grids have in place, these, these power producing uh, entities have in place that are going to contribute to the facilities that are, that are springing up to provide hosting and co-location services for miners? Most now have some kind of plan that's running them through 2050. And yeah. where, we're, where we're looking is, you know, if you're one of these power producers and you want to scale into renewables, you can't just shut off your fossil fuel plants because these aren't just powering Bitcoin mining facilities, they're also powering cities. So you have right. to do both simultaneously. You've got to build out your renewable sources while you're still running your fossil fuel sources. And these renewable sources are actually a great place for Bitcoin mining operations to thrive because they can use that power while the fossil fuel plants are still powering the cities. Eventually there will be enough to switch these over, but in the meantime, You've got to have something that will consume the energy that you're building up to provide the renewables while the fossil fuels yeah. are still working. And that's what we're and seeing. I we're seeing this mix come in. I think you just made two great points that I think are really important to highlight. <laughs> One is, you know, I find it really interesting that people are so concerned about Bitcoin's energy usage and not their own energy usage because an electron is an electron is an electron. And on sure. the grid, right, once an electron is in the grid, um, the grid doesn't differentiate between an electron based on what its power source is. So I find these arguments around the morality of energy usage as it pertains to Bitcoin or NFTs or whatever the narrative may be to be very illogical and very selectively yeah applied arguments. So I think it's important right. to distinguish, you know, I used to live in Texas um, and I would always get these adverts for Green Mountain Energy, which was a sustainable energy sort of electricity provider. Um, they charged sure. you, you know, double the price per megawatt hour for your electricity. But even in their energy mix, you know, only 10 to 20 percent of the electrons flowing through the wire came from renewables. Uh, so right. it really was more of a marketing gimmick than actually ensuring that the electrons being contributed to the grid and being utilized by you came from, quote unquote, clean or no emission sources. The second point that I think is really important with that you alluded to is this money battery capacity that Bitcoin has, where um, for renewable investment, right, 
which typically happens over a very long time horizon. And Caroline, mm -hmm. you can tell us about just how long that time horizon is as someone who's trying to build an alternative energy source um, for, for the world. But you know, given how long these investment timelines are and how capex intensive building renewable capacity is, I think this idea of Bitcoin being a battery that you can switch on to take that electricity and turn it into economic value to help fund that capex and that opex of operating these new um, sources of energy is a really critical feature that we haven't really even begun to explore yet. But I think is tremendously exciting and could be a huge boon for countries and economies who choose to pursue that path. Um, it creates jobs, it creates industry, and it creates a lot of economic opportunity. So love all of those points. Um, Caroline, let's move to you. So you come from a totally different world. You are not a Bitcoiner per se. You're working on building um, Oaklo, which is a venture-backed company that is producing small-scale nuclear fission plants or, or batteries, if you will. Um, you and I have had a few mm -hmm. conversations in different forums about the intersection of nuclear energy and Bitcoin, um, but I'd love to hear your perspective on some of the challenges you've seen in trying to add a new type of energy in, into the grid um, and sort of your perspective on the conversation we're having here around the potential yeah. to pair Bitcoin with, with nuclear. Absolutely. Um I love the top, like way you phrase this topic and even kind of, you know, as far as using Bitcoin to green the planet um, and the way you also kind of coined this idea of it being an energy battery, I think is very apt. Um, what I'd say is, you know, when it comes to clean energy, in, in, particularly in the United States, which is what I'm most familiar with, um, you know, nuclear provides more emission-free electricity on the grid than any other source combined. Um, and it remains that way. Um, and in fact, just one plant that's scheduled to be shut down in 2021 for no reason other than political reasons um, could power about 40 percent of the Bitcoin um, market is, is what I've read. So like we have these huge plants, these huge resources that are very close to 24-7. So the capacity factor, so in other words, the uptime of these plants, it exceeds 90 percent on average and sometimes even um, upper 90 percent. Um, so the uptime can't be beat. And I think that's one of the things we did see, and you probably saw particularly in Texas, is um, you know, when, when major climate events happen, which we're seeing more and more of, um, it's more and more difficult, I think, in the in the changing world to rely sometimes on, on renewables. So you need that kind of backbone, and ideally it should be clean. So globally, about two-thirds of electricity is, is generated by fossil fuel sources. And like you said, an electron's electron. How do we get more of that <laughs> other one third to be to be in place? So what we did at Oaklo is try to start with like the keep it simple, stupid idea, like just the smallest, simplest thing that we could get through the regulations, um, you know, meeting all the regulations and get forge a new regulatory path for these new technologies. And literally, the, the plants you're seeing on the grid now are decades old, like 50 plus years old, and maybe designed honestly, on basically slide rules using analog controls. And so we're trying to really just take an industry that was frozen in time and do it in a new way. Um, so we need, I, while we need these old plants, I, there's this new wave and a new way to do it faster. And it's also much more, um, I think, politically and socially uh, agreeable or acceptable or exciting. Um, so you can have different size plants, plants that don't require water, plants that can recycle nuclear waste and turn it into clean electricity. Plants that can be different sizes for different communities and have different financing models, all of which are really important. I think particularly on this topic with like Bitcoin, uh, we're looking at building what we call micro reactors or micro grid fit powerhouses. Um, and I think that's going to be really important to the, the deployment of both Bitcoin, but also nuclear kind of hand in hand. I love this idea so much. And um, at, in the conversation I had with you and your co-founder, Jake, I, we went off on this crazy, like, hour-long nerd out about this beautiful marriage of <laughs> Bitcoin yeah. um, and, and the the nuclear um, energy sector. And I fully agree with you. I think one of the 
interesting things for me. I come from the energy industry and particularly from the U.S. shale gas industry. I witnessed the birth of that industry. And the only reason U.S. shale gas really became so popular was because, one, um, there was a anomaly, anomaly pardon, in the natural gas market that made it economic for the first time to exploit these resources that typically were not economic to bring to market. But also, too, because there were incentives for play in place for um, power generation to switch to combined cycle, right, being powered by nat gas, which is lower emission than coal, but still very high emission in the context of renewables or nuclear. Um, and just witnessing, you know, the, the growth of that industry and subsequently its rapid decline, right? It was not a sustainable energy movement. Um, and I think it's been interesting to observe, you know, despite all of the rhetoric and talk within U.S. politics about energy policy and sustainability, particularly corporate sustainability and ESG, how little actual investment there has been in policy in infrastructure that would actually make it possible for us to decarbonize the U.S. energy grid. So again, this is a perfect instance of do as I say, not as I do. Um, <laughs> just, you know, incompetence is all around us. I think the last year has definitely highlighted that uh, for everyone. Um, but, you know, I always say Bitcoin is an antidote to dysfunction. And it's interesting to think about mm. ways that Bitcoin can make the energy grid less dysfunctional. Um, Mustafa, I'd love to shift back to you. Since you're actively sourcing power, um, today when you talk to renewable energy producers, and particularly on the hydro side, maybe you could just tell us a bit more on what those conversations look like. Are they paying you to take energy off the grid? Are you paying them? Like, I know there's a lot Lot of um, confusion, I think, around the the cost per kilowatt hour when you're sourcing different types of energy. And is it actually true that renewables are cheaper than fossil fuel sources of energy? Help demystify the source of energy for us and help us understand how you as a miner think about sourcing your energy. Sure. Um, so currently, in, uh, so, so going backward, uh, renewable energy is absolutely cheaper um, than the grid system. And that is largely due to uh, the infrastructure that is set up in Sichuan region. So in a lot of times, we uh, directly build up these mining farms right next to the hydropower stations. So uh, the, so we directly get them from the hydros. I think one part people miss is like, when you are transferring the energy, you have to up the voltage. And in order to, do, when you do that, the price of electricity also uh, increase. Uh, with a renewable, it's already cheaper. And because we are set up so close to this uh, hydro station, the cost uh, significantly decrease. I think this is one of the key reasons why mining is such a large operation uh, in Sichuan region. And it is also very important to note that in Sichuan, currently, there is already a large excess of power uh, in the whole region. Yeah. Um, so. so uh, so this is why a lot of the miners are centered there. And when you're talking about sourcing electricity, we mostly look at three factors, uh, price, voltage, and capacity. So the price mm -hmm. is very important for all the Bitcoin miners because that basically determine our cost of mining Bitcoin. And the voltage is also very important for us because that determine our infrastructure investment. Uh, if the voltage is high, like 110 or 220 kV, we need to invest in transformer to bring down those voltage uh, so we can plug in the mining machines. And capacity is also very important. The reason why you see a lot of large miner in this uh, region where there's excessive power is because we as BC Group typically look at uh, mining farms that are 50 to 100 megawatt. Uh, we can start at like 20 megawatt, but we want to uh, ensure that there is that extra capacity where we can uh, go up. Uh, so th that is a dynamic uh, in uh, Sichuan mostly. Yeah. Caroline, I'm curious with Oklo's, um, you know, smaller scale uh, nuclear um, generators, how much energy do those have the potential to generate? And would it be possible to put some of those with a Bitcoin mining operation? What could that potentially look like? Yeah, we're really excited about that, too. Um, so we're starting like our first plant um, just to just get something built like as soon as possible. We're targeting um, 1.5 megawatts electric roughly. Um, uh, and But our next plan, which we're already designing and planning on implementing soon, is more on the 10 megawatt uh, scale. So um, you can see 
um, and, the, and the beauty of it is that we can license them separately. So you could do one, you could do two, you could do three. You don't have to buy three pack at a time or something like that. Um, and we found that that's kind of a nice niche of, of size for a range of uses. So um, that's, that's kind of how it looks for us. Amazing. Well, I was thinking earlier, and I always like to use these opportunities to put people on the spot. I was thinking that <laughs> WIT, maybe you should work with Oaklo to put a hosting facility on the Compass um, sort of network right next to an Oaklo plant so that we could have the first nuclear powered industrial Bitcoin mining operation. What do you think? <laughs> Listen, I'd be all about it. Nuclear is one of the, uh, I mean, if, if I was going to choose an energy source for a facility on Compass, it would be nuclear. There's nothing that's more constant. Uh, it, it's a great source. You know, there's a lot of places outside of the United States where they tap nuclear for Bitcoin mining, mm -hmm. um, but it's not one that's yet been explored, I think, properly in the States. So I'd love that. It would be great to get an Oakle plant on, on the, the Compass network. I mean, look at that relationships, connections, <laughs> it's Let's happening, it. <laughs> always making deals. Um, the other <laughs> thing I'd, I'd love to just talk about, I think Mustafa, you really raised a great point. Um, in Iceland, for example, or even in Morocco, where there are a lot of renewables that are produced from hydro or solar or, or geothermal, um, it's really interesting because there's all this renewable energy that's produced. There's no natural industry to consume that power. So what's done? Um, it's piped through transmission lines and sent to very um, energy intensive industrial processes, which typically are smelting, aluminum smelting or iron smelting, um, which are extremely damaging to the environment. And so I think it's really interesting to observe, you know, again, from advocates for sustainability and clean energy, they have no issue, um, you know, digging up a, a under this, the straight connecting, uh, separating part of Morocco and Spain and running an interconnect through it to fuel highly carbon intensive and like highly, you know, energy intensive uh, aluminum smelting that somehow using hydro to power Bitcoin is deeply offensive. I mean, I'd love to hear Mustafa, when you talk to people about Bitcoin's energy uses, particularly in China, do, is there the same amount of sensitivity or the same amount of uh, sort of vitriol towards Bitcoin mining as we see here in the, the West? Or do you think it's something that's particularly American and European? <laughs> Um, so I think globally there are two types of uh, Bitcoin energy critic. There is one that just understand how the energy system works, but would argue Bitcoin doesn't provide much value to the society. Obviously, everyone on this panel, including us and a lot of the audience today, probably uh, uh, disagree with that statement. But it's, I think it's important to note that when you argue something doesn't provide a value, any type of energy consumption is probably a uh, waste. Uh, but again, we fundamentally disagree here uh, in China or in the US. Um, and there are other types of energy consumption critics that know how the energy system works, um, uh, who, who likes Bitcoin but doesn't understand how energy system works. So going back to yeah. China's example, uh, we are using already 100% almost renewable during the uh, summer season. And then during the winter, it's 43% uh, in Xinjiang region. Um, but I think it's very important to note that miners, uh, like we talked about earlier, does not determine what type of energy goes on this uh, grid. Uh, right. And even if you do withdraw the miners, uh, the, the policy on this capacity of the grid stay the same. Uh, so I think in China nowadays, I think we are more and more engaging in a conversation as a whole, uh, like you mentioned earlier, which is how do we fundamentally improve the type of energy that is powering our grid system today. Exactly. How do we make our grid system more renewable today? And I think that is a conversation us and every other large miner would love to engage in because one is environmentally friendly, but two, very important, renewable energy are cheaper. A burning fossil fuel and burning coal is not a cheap way to produce energy. 
It's absolutely not. And I think um, you raise a really good point. Again, I think the argument I so often find myself in, which is an unwinnable argument, is an argument around the morality of energy usage, which I think, again, you know, we, we don't have energy police. We let markets dictate who will or will not buy energy based on the price of that energy, which is something we witnessed, you know, when the brownouts happened in, in Texas recently, right? Energy prices soared. So people had to make a decision based on market price if they wanted to continue to run certain types of infrastructure or heat or cool certain types of facilities based on the market for energy. Um, Carolyn, I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about where the state of energy policy is in the U.S. today. What you're doing is so intensive from a regulatory perspective. I also feel kinship with you because both of our industries, you know, are very misunderstood and I think demonized and vilified in the press. Um, I'd love to hear a bit more about what your experience has been like trying to have conversations about energy resilience and uh, modernizing the energy grid using technology, as you've alluded to, um, what resistance you find and what you think the Bitcoin industry could potentially do to help make that easier for you or potentially provide, you know, support to make that conversation um, easier. Yeah. Well, there's so much to that. Um, I, first of all, I want to address a little bit. Um, we were talking, we we're talking about costs. And of course, that makes sense because we're all, you know, representing companies and, and money, you know, talking about money. Um, but also, you know, it's about cost is ultimately we think about, um, you know, how much the materials costs that go into it. And when you think about nuclear um, power, it's outrageously energy dense. And I think that's almost one of the challenges is just communicating that and like the human brain, like understanding it, like even the smartest human brains, right? Because one fission reaction is 30 million times more energy dense than one fossil fuel reaction. So like you burn, um, you know, a carbon versus um, you have one fission reaction. And that means if it's 30 million times more energy dense, you need that much less fuel to make it happen. But why is it still, you know, nuclear should, you know, back in the day, they were like, oh, this will be too cheap to meet or like limitless energy um, that's really not reliable and clean. And yet um, kind of all these different political things. And that's where your question comes in is like, what uh, challenges have we been facing? Um, I do think a lot of it's education or un under education, I guess, like people just not knowing. I think also, you know, we don't have to do it. Like I said before, you don't have to do it like we did 60 years ago. Like literally we don't do anything like we did 60 years ago. Um, but yet this industry is still in the past. And I think it takes new entrants and like startups to do it. I mean, I, we do look to Tesla a lot as like an example of like, um, you know, electric cars could have been made way before Tesla did it, but you know, someone just needed to do it and make it happen. And they started with like a roadster, which was probably kind of like mocked, right? Like it was hand built in a mall and it was like a niche product for the very wealthy, but they just started there. And that's kind of where we're starting is like a niche product of 1.5 megawatt. Um, it's not super competitive to start. Um, but that's just where we start. And we get to like basically our Model E and our gigafactories, right? And that's the idea. Like the yeah. challenges well, along the way. Know, I know a lot of yeah. Bitcoiners who would love to buy a 1.5 megawatt Oklo fission reactor to put in their backyard. So whenever you're ready, I think we have a yeah. lot of Bitcoiners who would love it. But you have to take payment in Bitcoin, just FYI. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, done. done. Um, yeah, so there, we see a, a good size market already there, um, for sure. Um, but we see even more, like energy is the biggest market in the world, right? And so it's just exciting to think about the future. But like when it comes to challenges to deploying it, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. It's just, you know, there's a lot of political ones. Um, we're in a highly regulated industry. Um, in some ways that's good, right? Like when you look at, um, you know, you're talking about externalities that are not being accounted for and, you know, if people want to talk about the morality of energy, let's talk about that. Like we know where literally every atom is in perpetuity. We literally have to plan for the fuel forever. And right now, you know, fossil fuels or even renewables, like their material counting doesn't have to be quite there. Where, where do we have to get to make the markets be more incentivized? I think it's um, like Mustafa was talking, um, you know, getting it, you know, having kind of a price for carbon could be one way. 
sometimes, but that has pluses and minuses to it, right? But it could incentivize the market to kind of start considering those things. But ultimately, what we think can motivate it is just getting the cost down cheap enough that everyone just wants to use it. And on top of that, it has these clean benefits. So that's kind of where we're headed. Right. I see a bright future for an Oklo reactor with like a Bitcoin containerized Bitcoin mining solution attached. So you actually get paid to run the reactor, which is kind of the way the original Teslas worked, right? There were a lot of incentives for buying EVs. So buying a very expensive fun car actually was not so expensive thanks to the subsidies that came along with it. Um, so I do think economic incentives obviously are very important and we simply haven't seen adequate economic incentives or disincentives develop here in the US. I also think it's deeply ironic mm -hmm. that we talk about energy usage, yet the CAFE standard, which is the standard for how many miles per gallon a vehicle needs to get, has not changed You know, really in nearly three decades. So our politicians care about energy usage and decarbonizing, yet cars don't need to be more energy efficient. And transportation is one of the largest consumers of fossil fuels in our country. So again, it's highly politicized. And I think this morality argument just very quickly goes out the window because there's absolutely no reason that yep. you need to drive a car that gets, you know, 10 miles to the gallon. <laughs> completely, it's sure. completely I, I, there's, ir there's ironies everywhere. Yeah, it's very, I'm 100% with you on that. It's for sure. Um, Wit, so the last thing I just want to touch on is data, right? I think um, when I started this conversation, you know, I said, hey, I'm going to make one unsubstantiated claim, but I was a debater in high school. I was a loser. I still am. So I approached it Please. like a debate. It's uh, great. I made all my cards. Um, I think one of the important things we really need to do is provide um, empirical evidence, credible empirical evidence around Bitcoin's energy usage and where um, industrial scale miners are sourcing energy from. I'd love to hear a bit more about what you have in mind as Compass and through the media platform you fill at Hashrate around um, you know, how you think the industry can help bring more of this empirical data to the forefront um, so that these claims that are made and these attacks that are made on the industry are easier to defend against? And then what can people like Mustafa, you know, who are running really sizable Bitcoin operations do to contribute to that data set in a way that doesn't impede on, on their competitive advantage and their very unique relationships that they probably have with some of their energy um, suppliers? So, you know, first and foremost, miners like Mustafa are doing, I think, the most good to drive this narrative forward because they are, they're chasing cheap power, right? Bitcoin miners want to consume the cheapest energy possible, and that's naturally going to come from renewables. And the only reason that there's any fossil fuels being used right now by Bitcoin miners is because that's what the grid provides, and it's, it's out of necessity. So we're going to see this transition happen naturally just as the grid starts to move off of fossil fuels and start to move towards this zero carbon future that most of them have targeted for 2050 or thereabouts. Um, but, you know, also you have the states like Kentucky that are offering incentives for miners to come and, and build facilities there. And yes, that's a, a boon for miners. It's a great opportunity for them. But if you're the state of Kentucky, what you're doing is you're actually providing a great fertile environment for these power consumers to come so that you can move away from being coal powered and start moving towards more renewable. So it's a win-win. When it comes to the research side, you know, we're in the process right now of accumulating a ton of data from the facilities that we work with on four different continents, and we're putting together a nice index. We've got a couple that have already re been released. We're putting one together right now for North America to really get a good idea of what the energy mix looks like, what these carbon emission or net neutrality plans look like as these companies move towards the future, and where we will actually see Bitcoin mining facilities be powered and what's the power sources that they're gonna draw from, right? We, we do believe that we're moving towards a, a cleaner future and that Bitcoin mining is moving us there, uh, but the, the proof is in the pudding. So we're gonna put this all on paper and release it and let everyone see for themselves just what, uh, what's actually going on versus what that low hanging fruit is that these Bitcoin futters like to grab at. The other question I'd like to ask you, Wit, since you're talking to people who, you know, are, are sourcing um, co-location and, and facility um, capacity from you, do you think there are uh, miners out there or individuals out there like myself? I'm just a lowly consumer. You know, I have one miner on the network, not 
a thousand sure. or ten thousand. Do you think that there are actually people who would be willing to pay a premium for their hosting or premium for um, space at a facility if it could verifiably demonstrate that it's using fifty percent, seventy five percent, one hundred percent no carbon energy? One hundred percent. There, there would be. There have been requests already. We're already looking into these 100% renewable sources that, that we can tap into to power Bitcoin mining. I think that as Bitcoin mining becomes less of a, of a focus on when is your return on investment or your break even point and more on the idea of securing Bitcoin's blockchain, I think we'll see that run in parallel to this desire for you know, tapping into more renewables. Yeah, and I think the security aspect is so important. You know, one of the most energy intensive activities we engage in is national security, right? All countries right. around the world spend tremendous amounts of, of energy, um, whether it's monetary energy or, or electrical energy, um, maintaining defense infrastructure. And so I think that often gets left out of the conversation. Um, I think Bitcoin is such an easy target because Bitcoin is extremely transparent about its energy usage, whereas literally no other industry in the world is that transparent about its energy usage. Um, but I do think as Bitcoin becomes more relevant to national security, as financial network security becomes more relevant to national security, as we've seen with attacks on SWIFT and ACH and Fedwire in the last year alone, you know, there have been numerous outages as a result of financial systems being attacked <laughs> by state and non-state actors, right, who are fighting yeah. in, in this new digital domain, um, I think it becomes increasingly important to view the Bitcoin network and other types of compute networks, right? This is now moving beyond Bitcoin into just compute more broadly. Um, they are a really important part of our national security infrastructure. And so I do think, you know, redeploying defense dollars from the physical domain to the digital domain is going to continue to happen. Um, already, Amazon, you know, is one of the largest service providers to the U.S. military. It's no longer Raytheon or Northrop Grumman or Halliburton. It's a digital infrastructure company um, that allows our military and our defense sector to store lots and lots of data um, in, in data centers that consume energy. So uh, I think this, this mashup of energy, national security, and cryptocurrencies kind of fit together in a really unique and special way. Uh, I like to joke with my dad. My dad is actually a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm a lowly economist and mathematician, but I studied energy economics. And I called my dad. I was like, dad, I finally have a use for my degree, like <laughs> over a decade later. It's finally relevant. Um, all right, closing thoughts. So we have about two minutes left. I'd love to do a round robin. I started this talk with a bold and unsubstantiated claim. I'd love to invite each of you to make a bold and unsubstantiated claim of your own on what you think the future of um, energy and cryptocurrencies will look like. So Mustafa, why don't we start with you? Caroline, we'll go to you. And then wait, you can close us out. Uh, sure. So, you know, really glad to be here today. And I think the future going forward for Bitcoin mining um, is going to happen in three ways. Number one, I think it will get more and more decentralized. We're already seeing that. I think today's uh, panelists like Wade or Caroline is going to help make it more decentralized. And uh, that's good for the entire ecosystem. Uh, number two, I'd like to mention that uh, we do believe Bitcoin mining will be more and more uh, renewable. Uh, that's partially because miners' mobility and the flexibility to migrate between seasons and between different locations, partially because we are also helping to push and uh, interact with policymakers to make the grid more renewable and so that power by cheaper uh, type of energy. Um, I think lastly, uh, they will see more mining pools uh, pop up in different regions um, that will also help Bitcoin more, uh, these mining more decentralized, all of which we are very, very excited about. Amazing. Caroline. Yeah, I think like Mustafa, I'd say, you know, the future of energy is small and distributed. And I think the future of, of most industries is needing reliable power and a lot of it. And I think that leads to nuclear. So I think with Bitcoin, nuclear could, uh, with Bitcoin, it'll move the country, the country and the world more toward nuclear power and nuclear power specifically, kind of like what we're developing. I will say one last thing. I've been intrigued by the idea of basically selling almost like NFT shares of like, or credits or something like that of clean nuclear power 
in order to, pep, you know, basically offset like ESG requirements. I'm also intrigued by that. But yeah, the future of energy is small. And I think the future of energy density is clear. So, you know, for me, I think that the the Bitcoin mining landscape, as more and more large industrial players get involved, it actually opens up the opportunity for smaller miners to get involved. It op opens up the opportunity for the individual to be able to start mining Bitcoin again. And with more individual participants, you have more people that have a voice. And as that voice grows, we're going to see this push for renewables more and more. I know that right now we have a few large actors that are pushing for more renewables to come into Bitcoin mining, but the masses are where it's at, right? If we can get a million people with a voice all mining Bitcoin on their own to throw some weight behind the push to go to these zero carbon sources, it's going to happen faster. Well, on that note, um, I have the three of you have just like excited me and they reignited my excitement about this this topic, which is something I've been spending a lot of time on. To everyone who's watching, I would encourage you, feel free to reach out to Mustafa, Carolyn, or Wit. They're all very online and on Twitter very actively. We'll try to have more conversations like this in other forums. Please feel free to reach out to me as well. And thanks to Real Vision for hosting this conversation today. It has been a delight and you can expect to hear more from all of us about Bitcoin and why it will ultimately green our planet. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.